Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to start just tonight by acknowledging that we are in the middle of witnessing the rapid genocide that Israel is inflicting on Gaza. And as we speak, as we have this conversation, this mass murder is ongoing. And those of us here in the US are funding it. And I know that many of us are recognizing the need to disrupt on every front possible, on the streets, in our daily work, in our daily lives. There was a global strike today in our conversations, in the halls of Congress. And I'm thinking about how Nadine Neber recently said on Truth Out's podcast, Movement Memos, we interrupt everything and we leave not one space in our lives devoid of our call to action. So we interrupt everything. And what we're here to discuss tonight is I think really aligned with that ethic of interruption. We are here to discuss the urgency of winning a ceasefire as a very first step. And we are also here to discuss the anti-MAGA struggle as the 2024 election looms and we're getting into that mode and how we have to fight to make sure that our focus on Palestine and on opposing Israel's genocide and apartheid and occupation is part of that anti-MAGA struggle. And with that, we're holding that even if a ceasefire is won, we can't abandon that work, including in the realm of electoral politics. And Max Elbaum, who's on our panel tonight, wrote a piece for Convergence magazine last month in which he pointed out, it is not easy to function in an emergency and prepare for a long haul fight at the same time. But in that piece, Max, um, you urged us to meet that challenge. And you wrote, staving off white Christian nationalist rule in 2024 depends on expanding the ground that pro-Palestinian forces have gained in electoral politics and shifting sentiment in the Democratic Party our way. These are such powerful and crucial goals. And so I'm going to briefly introduce each of our panelists. And after that, they'll each share a bit about how they're approaching these questions. So first, Lara Kaswani is the executive director of Arab Resource and Organizing Center, serving poor and working class Arabs and Muslims across the San Francisco Bay Area and organizing to overturn racism, forced migration, and militarism. Max Albaum is on the editorial board of Convergence Magazine and is the co-editor of Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections. Maurice Mitchell is a nationally recognized social movement strategist a visionary leader in the Movement for Black Lives and the national director of the Working Families Party. So we're going to hear a few opening words from each participant. And Max, since you wrote that convergence piece that inspired this conversation, I would love for you to start us off. And then we will go to Lara and then Maurice. <laughs> We faced many challenges in politics before October 7th, but the Gaza crisis and the ongoing massacre taking place there has posed some new challenges or posed old challenges in new ways to us. And when I wrote that piece, I said that we were facing two specific challenges. 
the first one, as you said, is to fight for a ceasefire. That's the first step toward dismantling the apartheid system in Israel-Palestine and ensuring equal rights for all. Uh, our task is to change U.S. policy so the U.S. government insists upon a ceasefire and threatens consequences to Israel if they do not abide by a permanent, durable, lasting ceasefire. Um, that's a heavy lift, but we should uh, remember that the protests that have taken place with it in this country are exceptional. Uh, both in size and in the number of sectors that are breached, including within the State Department, within Congress, uh, within the trade union movement. Uh, and most of all, we're part of a global, we're part of a global movement for a ceasefire. Uh, in, during the Iraq war, there was a day called the world says no to war. Uh, we're in a moment today, uh, the world says no to genocide, the world demands a ceasefire. So our prospects, even though it's an uphill fight, we're part of a global majority fighting for that. The second challenge is to make sure that Palestinian rights and the very humanity of Palestinian people are an integral part of the fight to stave off a U.S. version of fascism. Uh, it has to be included in the struggle in 2024 in the electoral realm and in other social movement struggles. Um, all who care about uh, Palestine, about stopping genocide, have to see that there is a path uh, that 2024 fighting for Palestinian rights and beating the fascist trend that's bidding for power in the United States are along parallel, are one and the same path. Uh, it's not the case right now with the U.S. administration complicit in genocide and the latest veto of the ceasefire resolution uh, at the Security Council. Um, but we have to change this not just because we want to win an election, uh, but because it's part right now the Palestinian struggle is at the cutting edge of the global struggle for racial justice, the global struggle against militarism and war, the global struggle for democracy, uh, it's part and parcel of that. It's part of the fight in the United States against the rising trend of repression, censorship, McCarthyism, what's being visited upon uh, people who speak out for Palestinian rights today is just a preview of what would be uh, visited on all progressives, all people of conscience, if we don't win this fight. It's a prelude to a new road of new McCarthyism in the U.S. So the Palestinian fight today is integrally related to all the other struggles for social justice. It's a key part of the agenda for democracy, peace, uh, and it has to be part of our struggle in 2024. Thank you so much, Max. Laura. Thank you, Max, and thank you for um, having this panel and allowing me to speak amongst two comrades I have deep respect for. Um, I'll just add to what Max said by saying the Palestinian freedom struggle is part and parcel of the fight against MAGA. It's also part of the fight against global authoritarianism and it's fundamentally, it is a struggle against fascism. The movement for a ceasefire today that we are seeing um, across the world is, is part of the broader struggle against Israeli apartheid. Um, which is a struggle against ethno supremacy, white supremacy, religious supremacy, fascism and right-wing authoritarianism. And it's today what we're seeing is the struggle against the most right-wing fascist government in Israeli history. Um, Hassan Kanafani, Palestinian intellectual and leader who was assassinated by Israel in 1972, famously said in 1970, in regards to Palestine, it is not a civil war. It is a people defending themselves against a fascist government, which you, the West, are defending. So today, we um, this war against Palestine, against the people in Gaza, this fascist war, is on a besieged 
Palestinian population, as was mentioned, with the full backing of the U.S. government. And we know that nothing can justify the atrocities we are witnessing or the scale of the human and material destruction that Israel has inflicted on my people, which is why the question of fighting the right and defeating MAGA in 2024 must be understood in the context of a growing consciousness around U.S. foreign policy and militarism, and in particular, around U.S. aid to apartheid Israel. Israel is one of the world's most powerful militaries in the world, backed by the most powerful military in the world. We know that Israel dropped more bombs in the first week on this war on the people of Gaza than the United States dropped in Afghanistan in a year. And we know for a fact this war on our people, on my people, could not continue without the United States, without the support of the U.S. government. Retired IDF Major General Yitzhak Brick said just recently, all of our missiles, the ammunition, the, pre the, precision, the precision guided bombs, all the airplanes and bombs, it's all from the U.S. The minute they turn off the tap, you can't keep fighting. You have no capability. Everybody understands we can't fight this war without the United States, period. So what we're seeing today is blanket support for Israel, no strings attached, no conditions, despite the outrage of the international community for Israel's violations of, of human rights, for its war crimes, for its genocide, war crimes that did not begin on October 7th because we know we're also witnessing an intensification of Israel's 16 year long siege of Gaza, the longest siege in modern history. It's also part of the 75 year struggle against colonialism and colonial violence made possible by the economic, military and political support of the United States. We're witnessing entire families being wiped out. But the US support of fascism, the US support of this genocide is also becoming increasingly unpopular. The pressure from the grassroots is, is in fact making a difference. Even though we're still fighting tooth and nail to get representatives to call for a ceasefire, more are doing so each day. And it's not that difficult to convince the street or in some cases to even convince congressional staff that this is a genocide. This is in fact, as my friend Rima said, the most well-documented genocide in history. So many of us in this moment, in the Palestinian movement in particular, have been in crisis mode over the last couple of months. It can't be um, understated how difficult this time has been and how we have all had to pivot to make sense of this reality and figure out how we can stop this genocide. But it can also be argued that we're witnessing a crisis in the US government. Now, when you have masses of people, at 1.80% of Democrats, the majority of all Americans supporting an immediate ceasefire, and you have elected representatives refusing to utter a word, or worse yet, signing off another 14 billion US dollars to aid in this genocide. We have a crisis. People are so fed up with the federal government, they're taking to city councils across the country, demanding for their local government representatives to speak out and pressure the Biden administration. And there we also have the local Jewish community relations councils, the JFEDs, and sometimes even congressional leaders attempting to criminalize these same grassroots efforts and even using racist, violent rhetoric to discredit the masses of people turning out for peace, turning out for ceasefire. The same rhetoric that has led to the murder of the young boy Wadir in Chicago being stabbed 26 times by his landlord the same rhetoric that led to three Palestinian students getting shot. You can't have the majority of people across the country calling for a ceasefire and only 4% of senators coming out for ceasefire. There is a divide in this country between representatives and who they represent and the political and economic priorities of the masses of working people in this country. That is why we understand our struggle today for ceasefire, our struggle against apartheid is a struggle against fascism in our homeland, homeland but it's also a part of the international struggle for economic and political democracy, for education and healthcare for all, for right relations to land, for freedom of all people, for social and gender justice, climate justice. And we believe all of that must be shaped in the interest of working people and looking ahead, which we'll talk about in a second, There's 
a plenty of opportunity and potential for us to build together towards that vision and towards those priorities. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for all of that context and just kind of grounding us in this bigger picture. Maurice. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I really want to thank you, Maya, for holding us. And um, I, I appreciate um, the contributions of, of Max and Laura every day and particularly today. And I'm so honored to be in conversation with, with both of you. And I just want to build on uh, the previous statements of, of Max and, and Laura. Um, and what I think is, there's a number of things that I think are, is, is really important. And what we're talking about is operating on many levels, but I want to talk about the popular level and then I'll talk about the politics. I encourage anybody who's watching right now to, to believe your eyes and ears, to believe your heart. Um, the reason I say that is that if you listen to some media sources, some media sources, if you, especially if you listen to, you know, as you were saying, Laura, if you listen to elected officials inside of Congress, you would think that the position, the ceasefire position is a niche position. The ceasefire position is a fringe position or something like that. When in reality, this is a majoritarian position. A majority of the people in our communities are aligned around this idea that whatever happened on October 7th, however atrocious those actions were, whatever feelings of concern and solidarity that they felt for uh, the people who are harmed there, that the idea that you respond to that with collective punishment of civilians is fundamentally in our core wrong. And day after day after day after day after day, watching those images, no matter how much those images are mediated by um, messengers that are very, very sympathetic to the far right wing in Israel who are pursuing the war, those images and those messages are being heard by all of our community members, are being heard not just by people on the political left in this country, but all people in this country. This is a majoritarian position, 80% of the Democratic Party coalition. A majority of people, not just Democrats, but people who identify as Democrats, Republicans, independents, have arrived at this position. And so there's a certain disconnect that's taking place. I would even dare to call it gaslighting as it relates to the ceasefire and as it relates to this large, multiracial, intergenerational, interfaith peace movement that is taking place in this country and all across the world. And this is one of those moments where the political class is so disconnected and off base as it relates to what's happening everywhere in our communities, um, in co coffee houses, in church basements, in PTAs. It, people are deeply disturbed by the suffering and the violence and the death of the Palestinian people day after day after day after day. So there's that level that is so critical that we remember and stay in context because it's easy um, when you're holding this position and when you're arguing and mobilizing and organizing for peace and you're listening to the political class that you're trying to challenge to, to allow the cynicism to lock in. But this movement is gaining. Every single day it's growing. And we're less, less than one year out from the 2024 election. And the decisions that we make along with the actions we take will in some way determine whether or not in this country we are in an authoritarian country or we have the ability and position to organize for a more democratic country. It's really that, um, that stark. Um, and this question of whether or not our country will continue to be liable for a dehumanizing war machine and billions of dollars with no strings attached in order to, to kill people that we see every single day on TV in Gaza is fundamentally wrapped up in the domestic politics of this country. And one of the things that 
I think we have an opportunity to do. I can't pretend to know everything that's going to happen in the future. What I do know is that there will be congressional primaries. And in those congressional primaries, a number of the leaders in Congress who are, who are organizing for a ceasefire fire are a number of them are going to experience pushback, significant pushback. And there's an opportunity for if we want to figure out what the elector, you know, as somebody who leads the Working Families Party, I'm often thinking about the electoral sort of uh, site of the struggle. If you want to think think about the electoral opportunity to to move our movement into an electoral posture, we're going to have a number of opportunities as we defend the champions in Congress that took bold action and continue to take bold action. Um, you know, and I want to give concrete examples because sometimes it's hard to discern how it really does it really matter if there's a senator here or a congressperson there uh, in a sea of people who are complicit, you know, and, you know, there was a bill that would have given unlimited unconditional aid to Israel that failed in the Senate. And one vote, the, the vote of Senator Bernie Sanders was the signing vote to sink that measure. And he was very clear about why. He said that the most effective way to change Israeli military policy, to make it clear to the right wing of Israel and Netanyahu that we're not going to give them this no strings attached money. That's that's one example. The other example is in the House. There was a time a, a few weeks ago when Representative Cory Bush sponsored a ceasefire amendment and a number of members organized around that ceasefire amendment. And at the time, if you had asked people whether or not we would see a uh, momentum in Congress, I think most people would have said no. But now that amendment and both both the people who signed on to the amendment and people who have made statements against the ceasefire is in the dozens. And altogether in Congress, when you take the people in the House and uh, folks in the Senate, it's more than 61 members, right? That is insufficient. However, that shows growing momentum and that shows the power of our organizing. Our organizing is working. Um, I think a lot of these messages and a lot of the stonewalling is in order to create cynicism so that we stop organizing. But I'm here to say that the organizing is effective. The organizing is ca causing debate inside of the Biden administration. It's causing the Biden administration's policy to, to shift, not nearly as far as we needed to, but those shifts demonstrate that everything we're doing is having an impact. And our job is to continue to do that. The work on the streets, the very creative protest and direct actions on the streets, the work that's happening inside Congress, the, um, the message that's getting out through efforts like this, through the media, all of these things add up in order to crystallize the fact that this is a majority position. And so the folks who are actually articulating the niche fringe position of collective punishment, of total war without an end in sight, they are the ones that need to justify themselves. Folks who are in the majority, who are calling for the, the rational and humane position, are the ones that really need to lean in and feel that momentum. And so I, the last thing that uh, I wanna talk about as it relates to that is, again, we're gonna feel this, we're gonna feel a test coming in the shape of close to a hundred million dollars in money that's been raised and has been, has been threatened by the organization APAC against a number of Congress people. And I implore everybody um, on top of being on the streets, on top of the advocacy and, and writing letters and doing phone calls, we're going to need to engage in some electoral advocacy. And our ability to defend those measures are going to, uh, are the, those members are going to shape the politics of 2024 to come. And I'm, I'm looking forward to um, organizing with people around those efforts. Uh, you know, folks like Summer Lee and Cori Bush and Ilan Omar, Omar and, um, and Rashida Tlaib and men, many others who are holding the line and um, their victories or defeat will be a significant um, milestone in both in the politics of, of our country's position in Gaza and in Israel and Palestine, but also in the trajectory of 2024. Thank you, Maurice. And um, thank you for reminding us that organizing works. 
I think, I feel like it's a moment where we all have to stare at ourselves in the mirror every day and say organizing works because we see it, like we see it happening and it's, its momentum is there. And on that note, Max, I, I wanted to ask you, so as Maurice was saying, increasing numbers of people in Congress, not nearly enough, but increasing numbers, are now supporting an immediate ceasefire. And there are even reports of fissures within the Biden administration. Things are changing, things are being pushed, things are moving. So what do you think that tells us about the balance of forces in the country and in government and policy making circles in particular? Well, I think one thing is that what's happened in terms of the strength of the movement and breadth of it, it builds on things that were happening over the last several years. Uh, there's been a general shift in the attitude toward the Israel-Palestine conflict, especially among younger people uh, and especially among Democrats over the last 5, 10, 15 years, which is a tribute to exactly what you said, organizing works. Um, in between 21, 2020 and 2023, for the first time, polls showed that a majority of Democrats were, felt more sympathy with the Palestinian position than with the Israeli position. That was the context for the current explosion. Uh, the other context was the shift in the generational experience, uh, because people who are under 40 the reality, whatever the uh, sort of mythology about Israel as the besieged weaker party in a tough neighborhood, all of that propaganda from the mainstream, the reality is people's experience in the world is that for the last people who are 40 now have never grown up at a time when Israel was not a bully, pushing around Palestinians, uh, making trouble in the region, all of that kind of thing. So that reality shapes the response after October 7th, and it exploded into mass politics um, at that time. Uh, a, this is a movement driven by the younger generations. The other dimension is that uh, for many years in the period when I first got involved in Palestine solidarity uh, soon after the 1967 war. It's, I'm an old man. Um, you know, there, were, there was a very small Palestinian, pop, Palestinian American population was very small. And most people's personal connection uh, with that part of the world was they knew somebody or knew somebody who lived in Israel. It's changed. This has changed dramatically over the years. People who are under 40, now almost everyone is just one step removed from someone who has family in Gaza or in the West Bank. Uh, it's a different mix. Demographic change has changed things. All of that comes into play when a crisis breaks out. Uh, we now have, uh, like Maurice said, there's 58 Congress people on record. Uh, supporting the ceasefire and four senators. Uh, you don't have to be uh, an anti-Zionist now to support a ceasefire. You just have to be opposed to genocide. So it translates into a majority position. And this position, uh, our, this view, like Maurice pointed out, it's a popular view and it has momentum. We're part of a growing movement. Uh, another indication is that APAC even in the last campaign, although they financed campaigns, hit campaigns against Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, uh, Summer Lee, they finance them, but they don't want to make Israel the issue on which they're fighting. They hide that and try to find something else that they can weaken their opposition on. So the person that they just got, for example, uh, Progressive Accept Palestine to challenge Jamal Bowman, gives a press conference where he says, well, this isn't really about Israel. This is, I'm going to hold all the progressive positions, but I'm just not going to go there. This is about, you know, uh, he doesn't really represent the district. He's 
trying to make a name for himself. APEC has realized that an, a straight up fight about the is, Israel's role in the Middle East, it's what it's getting up in terms of US aid is not a winning issue in the popular mind. So we have the opportunity to fight back on this. Uh, the balance of forces because of foreign policy is held so closely, it's the hardest not to crack of the different issues among the elite, it's held the most closely. Uh, they just, for example, bypassed Congress for the latest uh, shipment of munitions to Israel. It was announced that they bypassed the formalities that they even have to go through with Congress. So it's held very tight. Uh, but I think we are in a movement on the rise and combined with the international pressure, uh, which the US government and foreign policy establishment feels, uh, we have decent prospects if we keep it up and do what you said, interrupt. You know, interrupt each part and make this a part of uh, we're living through a crisis. It's as if we're living through a time when the Wounded Knee Massacre is being televised into every home in the United States. Thank you, Max. I, I think you stated this so clearly that U.S. aid to Israel is not a winning issue anymore. And that's this that's a massive shift. And thank you so much also for this reminder that the momentum that we're seeing in the movement for Palestinian freedom is a result of things that have been building for many years. So some people are newly coming to this issue right now. They're coming to it specifically around the demand for a ceasefire. And also we recognize that this is a movement with deep foundations. And I wanted to ask Lara on that note, in this particular moment, what can we learn from the existing organizing that has been ongoing for many, many years in the US toward Palestinian liberation? And how does that long history of organizing inform how we can approach the 2024 election? Well, the last few months have taught us that progressives and anyone committed to defeating MAGA in 2024 needs to understand the Palestinian, that Palestinian freedom and dignity is not only part of a progressive agenda, but unconditional aid and support of Israel is a wedge issue, as was just mentioned. Um, unmasking the contradictions of U.S. militarism and the growing base of Black, Brown, Indigenous, and other working class voters, that is what's happening as we watch this genocide unfold. Working class voters who are taking to the streets in over a million in number in the United States to stop this U.S. funded genocide. So it's going to be critical that we understand this as we move into organizing and mobilizing towards 2024 and beyond. There's clearly a breakdown in Zionist hegemony and its ability to normalize settler colonial violence in Palestine. The far right in Israel has unmasked the most naked aspects of the colonial project from Gaza to the West Bank. That is what we're witnessing today in Gaza is the logical outcome of that. And there's a breakdown in Zionist hegemony over young people, young Jewish people. I mean, we're seeing Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now, and other Jewish progressives and anti-Zionists across the country, shutting things down, turning out in the masses and saying not in our name. There is a breakdown in Zionist hegemony over Democrats, as was mentioned, 80 percent want a ceasefire. So and as it relates to APAC, it's no secret that APAC goes against progressive candidates, especially for those at the receiving end of their of their targets and attacks. And as Max mentioned, they don't just go against the, the progressive candidates who openly publicly speak out against Israel or for Palestinian freedom. They're also targeting those who support Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. And that perhaps isn't simply because they know Palestine and unconditional support of Israel is unpopular and not the winning strategy for APEC, but perhaps also because APEC is a pro-apartheid interest group and pro-apartheid interest groups are inherently racist and classist, and they're going to be at odds with a progressive agenda, right? So 
If anyone doubted this before, it's certainly clear today that the question of Palestine is central to any social justice movement. The movement in the streets is teaching us that today, but the movement across many generations has made that the case. And more people in the streets now than ever for Palestine. There are more meetings, congressional offices on the issue of Palestine than ever. More unions speaking out against this genocide and in support of ceasefire than ever. There's consensus across progressive communities that this war on Gaza, this US-backed assault on Palestine is a threat to the fight for democracy and a threat to movements for justice. That is clear. And as we look to 2024, I think I, as has been said before, our movement has always been an anti-fascist movement explicitly. And the Palestinian movement in the United States has long been linked to the struggle against all forms of racism. And indeed, against anti-Black racism, against Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Palestinian racism. And we see this intersection clearly in the composition of who's turning out of the, in, in these last two months um, and the alarming repression of the pro-Palestinian organizations, including jo Jewish organizations and other multiracial organizations. The McCarthyism that Max spoke of and the ways in which they're creating a chilling effect. Presidents are resigning. People are getting fired. Students for Justice in Palestine is being banned. I mean, this is just the beginning. And, the, and our, here in the diaspora, we understand our movement as part of this broader fight for fas against fascism, both here and how we're facing Zionist repression and also in Gaza and across Palestine. So we don't need to prove ourselves in that regard as Palestinians, as part and parcel of this growing movement, as, a, as part of the fight against fascism. But, and, we will not blindly back Biden. That is becoming increasingly clear. Our community, is not backing Biden with this genocide unfolding before our eyes and blood on his hands. And neither will thousands and thousands of others in the social justice movement. We have been suffering greatly under this genocide, but also we've also made gains and our organizing is working. When we name the Rashida Tlaibs, the Cori Bushes and how they continue to speak truth to power, despite the repression they're facing, we're also saying we're gonna defend them. As Maurice said, we're going to show up and ensure that we defend and protect those who are have the moral will and clarity and the political will to actually do what's right in this moment. But there's something really possible here in the openings that we're seeing. Fusing the Palestinian movement with the anti-MAGA movement should not be and is not a conundrum for 2024. But it's a way to add critical energy and an anti-fascist politics and to have moral clarity, courage, and the potential to win much bigger than we've ever seen. Because don't forget our community was right there in the center of the crosshairs of the Trump agenda. Our people are key constituents of the anti-MAGA front, front. Progressive pepism, progressive except for Palestine is not only a dead end for our movement, but I would argue progressive except for Palestine is a moot point today. There's no such thing as progressive except for genocide, progressive except for bombing schools and hospitals, progressive except for killing babies, right? So while we're suffering terribly under this genocide, we're also understanding that there's something to be done today. There's an opportunity for us to build together. And the inaction and the complicity of Biden and other Democrats, it's not just alienating Palestinians and Arab and Muslim voices. They're not just alienating the broader community that I represent. It's alienating the broader anti-MAGA coalition that ousted Trump. They're alienating the entire social justice left that is against this genocide. So the movement for ceasefire, we have to understand it as the movement that mobilized against Trump because it is the same people. It's some of the same folks in the streets. When I'm out in the streets or I'm in city halls or I'm in sit-ins, I see people who've tirelessly resisted the fascism of Trump when he was in office. I see people who fought alongside us at the Women's March. I see people who fought tooth and nail to resist the Muslim ban and shut down airports. I see people who fought against family separation at the border. I see people who are on the front lines of the COVID pandemic when Trump was content to see people suffer and die. And I see the same people who came out day after day during the George Floyd uprisings. 
I see our white allies, our Jewish allies, who did the thankless work of hitting doors in 2020 and 2022, in communities relentlessly targeted by MAGA. That is the movement today that is the forefront of trying to stop this genocide. That is the movement calling for a ceasefire. That is the movement in, in, in its entirety actually calling for an end to fascism globally. That's how we have to understand the Palestinian freedom struggle today. And that's what's possible if we do this right in the next few months and years to come. We should really not see ourselves as individuals making ethical choices when we go to vote in 2024. Ideally, we'd be making collective choices using collective strategies that make gains for our movement and protect all people, protect the lives of everybody against the future of global fascism. And if done right, we could truly fight for global democracy and actually realize justice and global democracy in a way we've never seen before. That is, I believe, what Palestinian freedom and the movement today that we're witnessing in the street is teaching us each day. Absolutely. Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much for that. And I think this reminder that the Palestinian movement has always been an anti-fascist movement is really important to bring into the light that we're not talking about fusing these disparate strands, but actually that they overlap, they're intertwined, some of the same people and the same values and just understanding the existing connections, I think is so crucial. And you talked a lot about coalitions diverse coalitions that are coming out for Palestine. And Maurice, I'll ask you this first, but I'd also love to hear from others. Um, in 2020, we saw this broad coalition that, that came together to stop a second Trump term. And currently, we see the broader democratic coalition among electeds at this point, divided over Palestinian liberation and even Palestinian rights. Is it still possible in your view to bring that electoral coalition together around a candidate? Um, is it possible to build those solidarities and linkages? And if so, how? And I think my emphasis in that question is on the how, because obviously I think we can do it. Well, um, a few things. I, I spoke early about us challenging some of the cynicism that's easy to seep in, right? And always recognizing, like as an organizer, fundamentally, I believe that transformation is possible. I believe it's possible on the individual level. I believe it's possible on the institutional level. And I've seen it. Is it easy? Absolutely not. It requires us to to lean in, it requires us to put a lot of effort in, and it, require, it requires us to be, to be thoughtful about being part of a shared strategy. And I think that's true here. I think Lara laid it out beautifully, the complexity and the diversity of the, of the anti-fascist, anti-authoritarian movement that defeated Trump last cycle, right? Um, we're going to have to build a movement that broad and that diverse again. Whenever, you know, historically, in any country, whenever we've faced a real fascist threat that has the possibility to take governing power, what has been required is a united front that includes all different all different factions. Um, you know, I I have you know shared that like one way of thinking about it is like the Cheney to Chomsky that uh, is sort of coalition, right? Like it's a very very broad coalition of people who disagree on a lot of things. Um, but you come together in order to defeat fascism because fascism is the one idea that seeks to destroy all other ideas. And in this particular moment, there's work that we need to do. I think there's also work that the Biden administration needs to do. And the Biden administration needs to take seriously the polling, take, take seriously the action that's taking, taking place on the street and take seriously this growing movement. And this movement is very diverse. It is multiracial. It is interfaith. And um, willful, willful thinking and hoping that this movement is a niche movement or trying to pin this movement on 
some activity or some behavior of one person or the other in order to discredit the movement is not going to make the movement go away and is not going to change the the challenges that lay ahead of all of us that are interested in building this pro-democracy force that is um at least electorally one of the key electoral pillars of this pro-democracy force is the democratic party and folks inside the democratic party are going to have to wrestle with this this challenge and take and and um so there's work that we have to do and then i think there's work that uh folks inside of the white house and folks in the various committees and folks in in various campaigns are going to have to really wrestle with with the the fact that all of these elections that we've won and we've won most of the statewide elections where democracy has been basically on the ballot we've won them marginally we've won them with a few thousand votes you know maybe ten thousand here maybe you know in georgia famously eleven thousand right um so these are going to likely be marginal victories and so if you look at the diversity of the people who are on the ground and the growing peace movement who are fired up but are growingly um, demobilized as they look at their options in November, there's a real tension there. Um, and when you think about the young people, when you think about the Arab Americans and Muslim Americans and Palestinian Americans, when you think about the black folks that are hitting the street, when you think, and you look, and we have data when we're looking at the cross tabs of the opinion polls that are showing there's a significant shift away from the Democratic Party coalition. That is a serious concern for everybody who's interested in fighting American fascism. Um, and I do believe that we absolutely can and we must organize. I think a, a, what's required is for us to, number one, big, build the biggest, broadest, most popular movement possible for ceasefire and for peace. That's one way. Um, there's a certain point where the contradiction can't hold, where there's so much support around this that it, it reaches a fever pitch and eventually the conditions shift. And I think it's only, only a matter of time if we continue to do the organizing and if we continue to reach out more and more to more people, it's only a matter of time before their position is untenable, right? And they actually have to shift their position. Secondly, I think it's important that we argue based on the same rhetoric and logic that the anti-MAGA forces use here in the United States, the fact that the MAGA forces are authoritarian, the fact that they're racist, the fact that they seek to take governing power and they seek to use governing power in order to redistribute cruelty. Well, the people who currently lead the state of Israel are a ultra-right, authoritarian, anti-constitutional, racist, um, uh, alignment of forces, right? And you don't have to take my word for it. This is the dom domestically, this is what people feel on the ground in, in Israel. And before, uh, before October, there was a huge domestic movement against that government because of how anti-democratic they were. And it's, it's well known that there are elements of that government that are uh, deeply, deeply racist and eliminationist. Uh, you're talking as far right and as and as racist as it could possibly be. So there's a direct moral, ethical, ideological, political through line between challenging MAGA and challenging authoritarians all around the world. And so this movement is holding a consistency that could mobilize people. It's harder to mobilize people, especially a lot of the young people and a lot of the progressives that are hitting the streets when you're offering a inconsistent logic for why we mobilize, why we organize, why we work against fascism here. If we can't consistently also have a movement that is working against fascism and authoritarian authoritarianism abroad. So I believe that we have work to do. I think that um, Democrats, the president and people who are, are currently operating out of line of the majority, they have work to do. Um, we have less than a year. And, but it's our solemn duty at, at Working Families Party and so, our solemn duty, I think, as progressives to, of course, prioritize the defeat of fascism. But we, we can and must do that without costing basic principles about aligning around freedom and about aligning against authoritarianism, wherever it is. That's powerful. Yeah, I, 
I think what you said about this movement holding a consistency, ceasefire and defeating fascism in the United States, holding this consistency is really a through line. And this idea of building the biggest and broadest and most popular movement possible for a ceasefire and that translating into electoral politics. And I think that one thing that others have mentioned, and I want to get to it before we wrap up, is um, speaking of our current president, who is pretty far from that current broad popular movement for ceasefire. So speaking of Biden, um, I would love to hear from both Max and Lara on this, if possible. So Max, you wrote last month that we need a bold program to defend all the electeds who support ceasefire and expand their ranks and press Biden to immediately reverse course or get out of the way. And a number of commentators have said recently that Biden is a weak candidate, should consider stepping back. Organizers have been saying, as Lara said, we won't vote for Biden. What's your perspective on this? And do you think that there are action implications of that for the left? Um, politics is complicated and we can expect a lot of surprises between now and next November. Uh, along the way, there's going to be some very important tests of strength. Uh, the one uh, that Maurice referred to before is the crucial one, I think, which is the contest uh, over the defense of the squad and others who have uh, come out for the ceasefire. And if we win those contests, and if we keep organizing, I think we'll create a situation where the Democratic Party leadership, uh, including but not restricted to Biden, needs to uh, figure out how to how they will incorporate our strength within that coalition. Uh, and that could take several forms. I think that the best, the, the, the obvious form is we'd like to happen on the sooner side, which is they uh, immediately turn around and advocate a ceasefire. And then uh, that happens. Politics has happened in other ways. Uh, I do think that there's an argument to be made that with enough pressure, uh, the social forces that are now in leadership of the Democratic Party will decide that Biden himself has made himself too much of a symbol of uh, complicity with uh, genocide in Gaza. And combined with the other factors, it would be better to have a different candidate to beat MAGA. There's no way to know for sure how that's going to happen. Uh, we need to keep pressing our issues. The, the essential point to me is that we have to be able to show that the path, the path to Palestinian liberation and the path to all the other progressive things that we want lies uh, with um, defeating MAGA in 2024. Uh, in 2020, I think one of the slogans that Maurice uh, put forward was uh, Biden wasn't the destination, he was the door. Uh, and we need a victory over MAGA to be seen as the door uh, to Palestinian liberation, as well as to the achievement of all of our goals. Uh, we're all uh, aware enough of the realities that those we're not going to get everything we want on January 21st, 2025, no matter who wins the election. But we will be advancing along a path. Uh, and I think that um, all our options are open. Uh, I think that whether or not it's too late for Biden to reserve, to reverse course uh, and shed the albatross of having been complicit in this genocide, uh, this is a dynamic question within politics uh, that uh, we'll see the answer over the coming weeks. Thank you, Max. Lara, would you like to share any thoughts on Biden? I shared earlier, but I will just say that absolutely understanding defeating MAGA as part and parcel of the struggle for Palestinian freedom is there and understood in our DNA as Palestinian people and Muslims and Arabs who experienced Trump in the Trump years. 
Um, and I think the work has to be done to bridge that gap in the coming days, so long as Biden is the Democratic candidate. Um, that being said, I will say that I feel really hopeful in this moment more than ever as it relates to the impact we're having on electoral politics. The fact that you know conversations about USA to Israel even happening in Congress, the fact that we have a number of people speaking out against the genocide, the fact that people are willing to put themselves out on the line the way they have is it's a different time. And historically, that's been completely separate from the mass movement strategy. And what we're seeing today is the conversations in Congress, the people at the front line speaking out and taking that, taking those courageous steps. Those conversations, those resolutions, they're actually in the shape of, they're being informed by mass movement strategy. There's something happening here that offers us an opportunity to think bigger than that, what's possible. Again, the Arab Palestinian Muslim vote, Biden may have already lost. But that being said, we have a time we have time from today moving forward, looking to 2024 and beyond. How do we actually learn and digest the lessons of this moment, the mass movement that has come out in support of, of peace and pro ceasefire against genocide, against a against APAC? What can we do in the coming days to continue to build power on the grassroots level, take that higher up and make sure that we actually create shifts in this country to redistribute economic and political priorities in the eyes and visions of working people? I think that's possible. I think that's possible with the visionaries on this call. I think it's possible with who we're seeing in the streets. I think a lot is possible and a lot of it is also speculation as to what's to come in this coming year. But we as the Arab Palestinian Muslim voter bloc understand the fight against Trump as a fight for Palestinian freedom as well. We also understand that we can't elect a president who has allowed this genocide to unfold. So both are true. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the themes of tonight really is two things can be true and there's also a sense of urgency that accompanies that, that, you know, we're holding all of these truths in tension. And there's a lot of momentum in this moment. And tonight, um, Max said at one point, and I think others have said versions of this, all our options are open. There are so many possibilities that have been suggested tonight so many transformative possibilities, really, so many different openings. And like Lara said, it's a different time. We are in the midst of a movement moment. And in that kind of moment, even as we're taking urgent action, even as it's an emergency, and I don't know about you all, but before we got on the call, we were just all talking about how exhausted we are, and that's real. And that's there. But at the same time as we're taking that urgent action in a movement moment, there's so much potential to imagine and build. And I'm so inspired by our speakers tonight to just get to work and do that. And I hope that all of you watching and listening have been as well. So thank you so much for joining us and have a good night.